So a good number of you actually think I just focus on pediatrics and internal medicine on this channel, but it's actually a medical channel and we cover all different courses, medical related. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at a topic in obstetrics and gynecology, which is a very important cause of antepartum hemorrhage, placenta previa. Remember that when it comes to antepartum hemorrhage, placenta previa is actually one of the most important causes because it's quite common. Remember the definition of antepartum hemorrhage is pretty much anyone that's going to be having vaginal bleeding, of course a pregnant woman, bleeding into the genital tract occurring from the age of viability up until delivery of the baby. So it includes even the first two stages of labor, so from 24 weeks to delivery. Some people use a much lower threshold for the age of viability of 20 weeks, others use the much higher threshold of about 28 weeks gestation. Now, when you talk about placenta previa, yeah, pretty much the word previa comes from the Latin word to mean in front of. So when you say placenta previa, it's pretty much the position of the placenta in relation to the presenting part. So the placenta is in front of the presenting part. Now, remember that placenta previa is pretty much just placental tissue that's going to be covering or encroaching on any part of the internal cervical ostium or the internal cervical os in front of the presenting part. Remember that you refer to a placenta as low-lying if it's if the edge of the placenta is not covering the internal os but it's within about two centimeters of it. A third of the cases actually of placenta previa or rather a third of the cases of antepartum hemorrhage are often due to placenta previa. So it means that out of 200 or 250 cases or deliveries one of them is going to have a case of placenta previa. And remember that the bleeding that we're going to be having in placenta previa can either be provoked in the sense of someone does a, a vaginal examination or, or a pelvic examination or a speculum examination provoking the bleeding or some sort of trauma. It could be due to sexual intercourse, then they have massive hemorrhage, or it could happen spontaneously, which is the case most of the times a woman wakes up in a pool of blood. Now remember that the bleeding pretty much is going to be of maternal origin, so the mother is more likely to be compromised than the fetus. So it's much more dangerous for the mother than the fetus. But then they would ask you this question, how exactly would you differentiate that this blood that's coming out is either from the mother or it's coming out from the fetus? You could do something that's known as an apt test. So this is also known as a hemoglobin alkaline denaturation test. It's pretty much going to help you distinguish whether the blood is from maternal blood or it is fetal blood. So what you simply do is that you're going to collect this blood in a, con in a test tube and you're pretty much going to be adding about two to three drops of alkaline solution, which is pretty much your potassium hydroxide. You get one mil of the blood, two to three drops of alkaline solutions. Now, remember that the fetal red blood cells are quite resistant to hypoxic environment and stressful environment. So they're going to resist rupture from this potassium hydroxide and the mixture is going to remain red or pink. Now in the case of maternal red blood cells, these ones are easily ruptured and the, the solution is going to turn brown. So if it turns brown, then you know that it's maternal blood. If it remains pink, then you know that this is fetal blood. You refer to that as an apt test. Now just a, a little bit about some anatomy before we actually go into details of the subject. Remember that the lower uterine segment used to be the junction or used to be the isthmus before pregnancy. And remember that the lower uterine segment doesn't have any contractile tissue. 
So as labor progresses, the lower segment actually stretches out and responds to the contractions of the uterus as labor is closer and closer. And it means that this lower uterine segment is going to be having loose folds of peritoneum that reflect from the bladder. It's going to be covered by the full bladder anteriorly and it's within eight centimeters of the internal cervical ostium at term. So that's the lower uterine segment. It doesn't have any contractile tissue. It's mostly elastic tissue. So it means that once now the, the pregnancy is going further and further and the cervix is dilating further and further, it means that even the blood vessels that are supposed to be uh, attaching to the placenta are also being separated from the attachment. Mm -hmm. This is like what actually causes the bleeding in placenta previa. Now, what are some of the risk factors? Remember that in obstetrics and gynecology, they're big on having the condition before as a risk factor of having it again. So people that have had a prior history of placenta previa, those with multiple parity, those with multiple gestations, advancing maternal age beyond the age of 35, those that have history of a prior uterine surgeries like a C-section, a myotomy, even a hysterotomy, or even other procedures like multiple dilatation and curettage, which are your DNC procedures. With smoking and large placentas, remember that when someone smokes, there is carbon monoxide that they actually inhale. And this carbon monoxide binds to their hemoglobin to form carboxyhemoglobin. And to some extent, this actually causes a carbon monoxide induced hy hypoxia or hypoxemia. Now this actually stimulates the placenta to grow much larger than it's supposed to be. So there's going to be some placental hypertrophy. You may also have some placental abnormalities such as a succinctuate lobe or an accessory lobe of the placenta, even some uterine structural anomalies and fetal anomalies. Now, exactly what causes placenta previa? We, we do not really know the underlying cause, but some theories have been postulated. The first theory is, of course, what's known as the drop-down theory. So here, remember that fertilization is pretty much going to be happening, or it's supposed to happen, pretty much in most of the cases in the fallopian tube. So you get a fertilized um, ovum that's going to descend, and eventually it's going to implant on the lower segment of the uterus. Now... What can cause this? A poor decidual reaction in the upper segments of the uterus can cause this where by the time the fertilized ovum gets to the upper segment, it's not yet ready to receive this fertilized ovum. There can also be failure of the zona pellucida to disappear in time. Uh, that is a hypothetical possibility. Because remember that once, an, once the ovum is fertilized, it forms this barrier around to prevent any other sperm from entering and fertilizing it twice. That's why you only have one sperm fertilizing one ovum. So the failure of uh, disappearance of this zona pellucida could sometimes be uh, explaining the central type of placenta previa. In another theory, we actually postulate that there is some persistent of chorionic activity, especially in the decidual capsularis, and subsequent development of the capsular placenta, which comes in contact with the decidual vera of the lower segment. This can actually explain the other lower degrees of placenta previa, the placenta previa minor. Then of course, you may sometimes have big surface area of the placenta as we see in multiple gestations, as we see in smoking, and anything that can be causing hypoxemia. In some cases, you may have a de defective decidual reaction. So there's a spreading of the chorionic villi over a wide area of the uterine because the whole goal of the placenta is to mediate pretty much nourishment for the fetus and take out the waste from the fetus between the fetus and the mother. So remember that during the process of um, placentation, not only does this placenta become membranous, but it also encroaches on the lower segments of the uterus. And of course, the placenta previa can sometimes be associated with other placental um, abnormalities where there is uh, excessive invasion of the placental tissues into the different walls or the different layers of the uterus. So it can result in complications like placenta accreta, placenta percreta, and placenta increta. Now remember, as the placenta is going to be growing slowly down later in the months, and the lower segment begins to dilate later in the months as you're going towards term, remember that the placenta is inelastic. It doesn't have that much elastic tissue. So it's easy for it to shear off from its attachment in the lower segment. And remember why, how the, the blood vessels stop bleeding in the uterus in the upper segment where you have the muscles. Remember that the blood vessels, the muscles are crisscrossing across the blood vessels such that when there's contraction, they, com they clamp down and they compress the blood vessels and prevent bleeding. You don't have this in the lower segment of the uterus.
So as now you're getting much, much closer to term and there's a dilatation that is happening, this placenta is separated from the wall, it's easier for the bleeding to actually take place. Now, like I say, there are some mechanisms that control the spontaneous bleeding. For example, the thrombosis of the open sinuses, mechanical pressure of the presenting part, even the placenta infarction, you could have an infarct blocking and preventing the bleeding. Now, what's the pathology that we expect? The placenta is going to be large. Sometimes it's going to be thin. It may have a tongue-shaped extension from the main placenta. It may have extensive areas of degeneration with infarction and calcification. The placenta itself could be morbidly attached to the lower segment because of a poor deciduous formation in the lower segment. Then when you look at the umbilical cord, the cord may be attached to the, mar to the margin, which is known as a battle door umbilical cord, or it can be attached from the membranes, which is known as a filamentous umbilical cord. These are some key stations that they can actually bring you on your OSCE station where you, you are able to distinguish between a battle door uh, insertion of the cord and a filamentous insertion of the cord. Then remember that insertion of the cord may be close to the internal ostium or the vessels may actually cross by the internal ostium such that when you have rupture of the membranes you can have uh, damage to these blood vessels because they're not protected by the Wharton's jelly and this can actually cause vasa previa. Then of course in the lower segment of the uterus because there's a low vascularity the lower segment and the cervix may become soft and they may become more friable. Now, how do we classify placenta previa? So pretty much four grades, okay? You have grade one, which is a low-lying placenta. You can call it as a lateral. So now here, the majority of the placenta is going to be in the upper segment of the uh, uterus, while as the part of it will be in the lower edge of the uterus, or rather the lower segment of the uterus, but it does not uh, pretty much reach the uh, ostium. It's actually within two centimeters of the internal ostium. It doesn't cover the ostium. It doesn't touch the ostium. Then in grade two, you have a marginal placenta previa where the placenta edge actually reaches but doesn't cross the internal os. Then grade three, it's partially, you call this as a partial central, it's a partial placenta previa where it covers the, the os when it's closed, but then when it's fully dilated, it doesn't cover it entirely. And then grade four is where you're now completely covering the placenta, the cervical ostium. So even when it's dilated, it's completely covered. You call this as placenta previa totalis or the central type of placenta previa. The majority of these types of placenta previa could either be anterior or posterior. It's much more common to get a posterior presentation. Now here's a picture to show you the different grades. So here on your screen, you have a low-lying placenta over there, so it's within two centimeters of the, the cervical os. Then of course, if it's just touching the os, that's the, the grade two, your marginal placenta previa. If it's covering the os, but not entirely, then you call this as your partial placenta previa. Then if it's completely your placenta previa totalis, then you call this as your grade four. Or you can think of this as type one, type two, type three, and type four. Type 1 is known as the lateral variant, type 2 is known as the marginal variant, then type 3 and 4 are both central variants, but type 3 is a central partial, then type 4 is a central total. So what you really need to note is that with the type 3 and the type 4, these are going to be constituting a third of the cases that we see. For clinical purposes, we can actually divide them into predominantly two groups. Those that are in type 1 and type 2, Post, uh, type 1 and type 2 anterior, those are referred to as a mild because someone who has a type 2 anterior type of placenta previa, you can actually deliver them vaginally if you are an experienced obstetrician. Then, of course, those that are type uh, 2 posterior, there's a high risk that the, the opening of the birth canal will be greatly reduced. The anterior posterior diameter, as shown in the image here with the type 2 posterior where the placenta is on the posterior wall, this e effectively reduces the anterior posterior diameter of the inlet and therefore it makes it very difficult to deliver vaginally. So the type 2 posterior, the type 3 and the type 4 are referred to as the major placenta previa. So these you want to deliver them via C-section. Now remember that the type 2 uh, posterior is actually very very dangerous. Why? It's because one, the curved birth canal, the major thickness of the placenta, which is about 2.5 centimeters overlies the sacral promontory. So thereby this is going to greatly diminish the anterior posterior diameter and such that the engagement of the presenting part is going to be prevented. And this actually hinders the 
forward movement of the infant, such that if the infant attempts to go past this, it would lead to compression of the placenta and this would actually stop the blood flow. And of course, the placenta is most likely to be compressed if you deliver this vaginally and the child may actually die from anoxia because they won't be receiving any oxygen through the umbilical cord and the placenta. So there's a more chance of cord compression, there's a more chance of cord prolapse, and there's a higher chance of fetal anoxia that can lead to death. So that's why we want to deliver these via caesarean section. Now, what are some of the clinical features that we see of placenta previa? Now, this is what I want you to pay close attention to. So you're going to be having a sudden onset of painless, that's number one, bright red vaginal bleeding. Most of the times it's causeless, so there's no cause that's associated. Unlike with placenta abruption, which is most of the cases may be associated with trauma, we hardly ever see this in placenta previa. The only thing that we may see in placenta previa is this woman waking up in a pool of blood. That's the characteristic feature that they'll bring you on your exams. And of course, it tends to be quite recurrent. So in 5% of the cases, it may actually be the first time during labor, especially in the preemie gravidus. Then in a third of the cases, they may actually get this warning hemorrhage which is just pretty much this slight brisk bleeding that they get, sometimes even spotting during the first or the second trimester, then it subsides. Then this is like a warning sign because it may worsen later on in, in the pregnancy. So the bleeding is not related with any activity and usually occurs when the patient is sleeping. So they wake up quite frightened because it's painless. They're not able to perceive that they're bleeding. So this bleeding is not associated with pain unless if labor starts. So if labor actually starts, it's very difficult to actually distinguish it from placenta abruption clinically. So you'd have to get an ultrasound. So there's no cause of placenta separation. So there's no trauma or hypertension. However, preeclampsia may actually complicate some cases of placenta previa. And of course, the first episode may not usually be alarming, but the subsequent ones are going to be much heavier. So if you get some warning signs, then this, this woman must remain vigilant. Because remember that it's the mother who's at greater risk because the bleeding is coming from the mother. Now, in most of the cases, the bleeding happens roughly around 38 weeks and earlier if it's in the major types of placenta previa. So that's why we want to aim to deliver them roughly when they when they cross the 36-week threshold, from 36, week, uh, 36 weeks to about 37 weeks plus six days. So between that, that threshold, that's where we want to deliver most of our patients. So... Unless otherwise, if there's any other indication that may warrant them to be delivered there and then, for example, if there's some form of maternal or fetal jeopardy. Then, of course, bleeding is of maternal origin, like I said, although the fetal blood may also escape from the torn villi, especially if the placenta is separated as due to trauma. There may be features of malpresentation, which is very common, uh, and this actually prevents engagement of the presenting part. In some cases, it may actually be asymptomatic and we just discover it incidentally when the woman comes for an ultrasound or even at the time of cesarean section. Now, what are some of the signs? Those are symptoms. So you may get features of anemia, but of course, this is going to be proportional to the visible blood that you is going to be there. So if there's a lot of blood, there'll be features of anemia, severe features of anemia. This sometimes can be confusing if already this woman had a pre-existing anemia, so they'll come in with just a loss of little blood, but they're in shock. So you should suspect that there is a pre-existing anemia in this patient. In some cases, the bleeding may actually be quite heavy. So they may come in with features of hemorrhagic and hypovolemic shock. So that's your thready pulse, your hypotension, your dizziness. Sometimes they may even have collapsed. Then abdominal examination, pretty much your size of the uterus will be correlating to the gestational age. The uterus itself is relaxed and soft. Remember, this is different to your placenta abruption where the uterus is, is, is quite tense. And of course, the, it's going to be elastic without any localized area of tenderness. There may be an abnormal lie, so there may be breech presentation, there may be transfers, or even an, 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 another unstable lie. You may get a high presenting part. And of course, there is an, you may sometimes palpate multiple fetal parts in the, term, in the case of twin pregnancies. Then the head is going to be floating in contrast to the period of gestation. So there is permanent displacement of the head, which is very, very suggestive. The head cannot actually be pushed down into the pelvis. Now, an important thing to do is actually monitor the fetal heart. So if the fetal heart is present, then this is a good sign. And of course, if it's present and the, that it's reassuring, then it's a good sign. But in some cases, when you attempt to push the fetal 
part to put the to push the presenting part rather down in the pelvis what you're going to be seeing is that the heart rate is going to slow down because you're compressing on the placenta you're compressing on the, the vessels the the fetus is not receiving oxygen is not receiving enough blood supply so once you push the, the presenting part downwards the the heart rate slows down once you let go of that and the presenting part moves back up then the heart rate will recover so this is very very characteristic especially with the posterior type of placenta previa it's known as a stalliwarts sign stalliworth is an s t a w l w o r t h y you call this as a stalliworth sign you can elicit it but it's not always significant and this is because just compressing the the head of the fetus will also cause an abnormal uh, change in the the heart tracing of the fetus and of course you should perform a valve inspection take me right here valve inspection i didn't say do a vaginal examination i didn't say do a pelvic examination just inspecting the valve to see if there's any blood and usually the blood is going to be bright red and you can even assess the amount of blood that is lost now if a woman comes in with bleeding after 20 weeks we are not supposed to do a vaginal examination please do not do a speculum examination please do not do a pelvic examination until you have done an ultrasound and you have ruled out placenta previa we always assume that anyone coming in with bleeding after 20 weeks we assume that it's placenta previa until we prove otherwise so painless and recurrent vaginal bleeding in the second half of pregnancy should always be considered as placenta previa until you prove otherwise because if you do a, a digital um, not a digital but rather a vaginal examination if you perform a speculum examination or a pelvic examination you're pretty much going to exacerbate the bleeding and make it worse so sometimes you may get placenta previa that's associated with uterine cramps when they're in labor it's very very difficult to distinguish this now from placenta abruption then when a woman actually presents with antepartum hemorrhage like i say do not do a pelvic examination until you have excluded your placenta previa now how are we going to exclude this pretty much our diagnosis is going to be via, via ultrasound so this can help you actually assessing the fetal size the fetal status it also provides information pertaining to the maturity and the well-being of the fetus for guiding your management it also helps you actually localize the, the site of the placenta so there are three types of ultrasounds you can do your transabdominal ultrasound which is what i reckon you will be doing in most of your hospitals locally you can also perform a transvaginal ultrasound which is actually much more superior to the transabdominal ultrasound you can also perform a transperineal ultrasound so now with the transabdominal ultrasound this is where now you're going to be placing the probe over the abdomen okay just like the, the usual obstetric ultrasounds that are done so 98 percent of these after the 30th week of gestation are going to be rather can pick up the placenta previa you may get some false positives that may be due to of course a full bladder um, of uh, or even myometrial contractions and of course the poor imaging could also be a factor here especially in maternal obesity or even in a posteriorly situated placenta it can be very difficult to actually visualize and the reasons why you get a poor image with a posteriorly situated placenta is because uh, the way ultrasound works it sends a, a, a sound wave okay a sound wave that is that descends into the tissues then that sound wave actually reflects on the tissues and then it's sent back to the transducer or to the probe and then it, you pick it up on the machine so the acoustic shadow from the presenting part may actually obscure the uh, placental view then of course there are no anatomical landmarks posteriorly uh, below the uh, placenta which is defined and in arbitrarily an arbitrary distance actually of about five centimeters from the internal os is actually considered as a low uh, as the placenta being in the lower segment and then in the transvaginal ultrasound it's it's much more specific where you now get a transducer and the transducer is placed within the vagina without actually touching the cervix now here it's very very close to the target and you can actually give out higher frequencies of sound and this actually gives you a much better resolution so it's it's actually safe it even avoids the mother having to have that discomfort of having to drink water so that the bladder is full to use that as your landmark then of course it's much more accurate virtually almost close to a hundred percent than the transabdominal ultrasound and your complete preview in the second trimester will uh, persist into the third trimester in 26 of the cases 
And then in some cases, the placenta may actually migrate. I'll talk about this in the next slide. Then you may also do a transperineal ultrasound. It's accepted by some patients. And of course, the internal os is visualized in about 97 to 100% of the cases. You should also do a color Doppler flow study. You, you see that there are some prominent venous flow in the hyperechoic areas near the cervix, and this is actually consistent with the placenta previa. You'll see that there are blood vessels here near the cervix. Then here's what it looks like on ultrasound. As you can see here, you, here's your placenta here covering the os, this dark area here. That's covering the os. So that's your uh, placenta previa. Now, there is something that's known as placenta migration. Now, if you do an ultrasound quite early, somewhere like, let's say, 17 weeks of gestation, most of the cases, and about even 10% of the cases, you reveal that the placenta is actually covering the os. You don't call that as placenta previa. You call that as a probably a low-lying placenta because it may actually migrate. Now, when you repeat the ultrasound roughly at around 37 weeks, you may actually see that the placenta is no longer in the lower uterine segment in about 90% of the time because it migrates. This is because the lower uterine segment actually expands by 0.5 centimeters at 20 weeks to more than 5 centimeters at term. So there is a resolution of the placenta previa. So you can't really say that this person really had placenta previa. So it means that the term placenta migration can actually be explained by two things. The first thing is that there's progressive increase in the length of the, the lower segment. So it lengthens as the, the pregnancy goes further and further. So such that the, the placenta itself seems to have relocated away from the os. And of course, there is also some tropism, which is the growth of the trophoblastic tissues towards the fundus because there's more blood vessels, there's more nutrients in that area as compared to the lower uterine segment. Now, we can also offer to do an MRI. This is done if they're, though... Um, it's expensive, you may not have the time, you may not have the machinery, but of course it has some advantages uh, of doing it. And advantages of ultrasound versus MRI is that in ultrasound, the need for vaginal examination with risk of hemorrhage is avoided. The need for prolonged and even unnecessary health uh, hospital stay is also avoided and it's reduced. Now, of course, the diagnosis can actually even be made before the bleeding starts. And of course, if in a morbidly adherent placenta, like for example, the placenta accreta, percreta, and increta can actually be your diagnosed. And of course, the plan to deliver can be made with the patient and the obstetrician. Now, what's our differential diagnosis? I want you to keep in mind abruptio placenta. You, it may also be vasa previa. You may have local cervical causes like polyps, carcinomas. They should be able to differentiate this by speculum examination. But of course, that's only after you have ruled out placenta previa on your ultrasound. Then it may be a circumvalid placenta. You have a bleeding which is slight and the diagnosis is only made after examining the placenta following delivery. Now, here's a distinction between placenta previa and placenta abruption. We'll talk about placenta abruption in the next lecture of antipartum hemorrhage. Now... The clinical features, clinically, placenta previa will present you as this painless, causeless, recurrent bleeding, which is bright red. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, it's proportional to the visible blood that you see. There may not be any associated features of preeclampsia. On the other hand, with placenta abruption, it's painful. It's associated with preeclampsia or trauma, or, and it's continuous. Then, of course, it may be revealed, concealed, or usually mixed, and the blood is going to be dark in color and the features, the general condition of the anemia is going to be out of proportional to the visible blood because sometimes there may be some concealed hemorrhage that may be there. The uterus in placenta previa is appropriate to the gestational age, but it may be disproportionately large in the concealed type of hemorrhage with abruptio placenta. The uterus is soft and relaxed in placenta previa. In abruptio placenta, it's tense, tender and rigid. Then malpresentation is quite common in placenta previa as the head is going to be floating high. It's unrelated in abruptio placenta. The head may actually even be engaged. Then, of course, the fetal heart rate is going to be present in placenta previa. And in abruptio placenta, it's usually absent, especially in the concealed type. Then, of course, you want to do your ultrasound. You see the placenta in the lower segment. While it's in abruptio placenta, the placenta will be in the upper segment. Then, of course, vaginal examination. If you do decide to do a vaginal examination, especially in theater, you may fill the placenta in the lower segment and of course the placenta is not felt in the terms of abruptio placenta in the lower segments. Uh, blood clots uh, should not be confused with the placenta in this case.
Now, how do we manage this? This is very, very important, especially for the final year students. Now, remember that all the cases of APH, even if the blood is slight, even if it's absent by the time the patient actually reaches the hospital, you have to regard it as placenta previa until you prove otherwise, because the bleeding can actually be much worse at a later stage. It may be torrential bleeding. And of course, the management will largely depend on the gestational age, the severity of the APH, and the type of placenta previa. Generally, I want you to keep in mind these three things. So hospitalization and a modified activity for a first episode bleeding before 36 weeks, that's what we usually do. If the fetus is okay and the mother is okay. And of course, we deliver the mother or the fetus if we deliver the fetus rather if the mother or the fetus is unstable then of course if the woman is stable then they are not yet be at 36 weeks then we can perform conservative management where we can actually strive to push them towards 36 weeks between 36 weeks and 37 uh, weeks so between that aspect now what is our initial management of this patient so we pretty much want to admit the patient we want to assess how much blood they have lost so we look out for features of pallor features of uh, their pulse rate any uh, the blood pressure then of course we gain access with our two large bore cannulae we get their blood we send it for cross matching and blood grouping we should at least secure at, at most six units and of course we also order for a full blood count and a clotting profile then we run an infusion of normal saline as we await for blood that's compatible and of course we gently palpate the abdomen to ascertain if there's any uterine tenderness and we also tate for the fetal heart now remember we just only should inspect the valve do not perform a pelvic or vaginal examination then of course confirm your diagnosis through your history your physical examination and your ultrasound findings then of course the further management is going to be either expectant management or active management i'll talk about this just now so how when in what group of patients do we actually carry out expected management so we should consider it when the availability of blood in the facility that you're working in or if you have 24-hour c-section facilities so we should consider this for example number one if the mother has good uh, health status if the hp is greater than 10 or their hematocrit is greater than 30 percent Number two, if their duration of pregnancy is less than 36 weeks. If they're 36 weeks, we aim to deliver them. If the woman and the fetus are stable, so it means that if there's no active bleeding, if the fetal uh, well-being is assured on the ultrasound, then of course, what are we going to do in this expected management? So bed rest and pelvic rest, so it means no sexual intercourse with, of course, some bathroom privileges. Then, of course, we investigate this woman, so our FBC, our blood grouping, our urine for protein. Then, of course, we should inspect the valve pads and inspect the fetus with ultrasounds every two to three weeks until we get them to roughly around 36 weeks. Supplement them with hematinics and replace any blood loss with any transfusions if the patient is anemic. Then, there are some people that think that once you have contractions, then we should stop them with tocolytics. No, tocolytics usually should, can be used, but generally we would want to avoid them especially if the membranes are ruptured because there's a very high risk of this developing into a chorioamyonitis or an intrauterine infection. So there are some people that have also suggested cervical circlage, but usually that does not help at all. Then do not forget for all women that are RH negative, give, give them Rogam, the anti-D antibodies. Then of course expectant management should be carried out ideally in hospital but because of the space that we have in hospital and we can't admit every patient that comes in with APH there are some patients that we can actually manage as outpatients so they should follow uh, or should fall under specific criteria so the first thing is that the patient must actually live very close to the hospital the second thing is that they should have transportation 24 hours in case the bleeding gets worse to get them to the hospital they should assure us that they are going to have bed rest and of course, the patient should be motivated and they should understand the risks of their condition. Then, of course, the expectant treatment should be carried out up until a maximum of about 37 weeks of uh, pre uh, pregnancy. And then of, at this time, we can actually deliver the child. Now, preterm delivery sometimes can be done if there's recurrent hemorrhage and it's continuing bleeding. If the fetus is dead, if the fetus is congenitally malformed, 
or if you discover this on investigations, then you want to deliver them regardless of the gestational age. Now, if you deliver them prematurely, if the pregnancy at least is less than 34 weeks or between the bracket of 26 to about 34 weeks, we want to give them dexamethasone before to mature their lungs. So we give them our dexamethasone, our six milligrams as an intramuscular injection. We give it every 12 hours and we give it for four doses. Then definitive management, the indications are pretty much dependent on Number one, if the bleeding is occurring at or after 37 weeks, we want to deliver them. Number two, if the patient is in labor, deliver them. Number three, if the patient is exaggerated, if they have drained all their blood or they're almost draining all the blood, deliver them. If there's continuing or even moderate degree of bleeding, deliver them. If the baby is dead or there's a congenital anomaly, we want to deliver them. And how exactly is the mode of delivery? Generally, we want to do a cesarean section for the major types. For the minor types, you may attempt to do a vaginal examination, but this should come with experience and you should monitor this person vigilantly such that if things go wrong, then you actually take them to theater. So for women that have sonographic evidence of placenta previa, for example, if the placenta edge is within two centimeters from the internal os, if the, the placenta edge is within two centimeters of the internal os, then you pretty much want to uh, deliver them via C-section then this should be performed obviously by a senior obstetrician then vaginal ex delivery can sometimes be considered if the placenta edge is clearly about two to three centimeters away from the internal os and this is based on your sonography then when you do your vaginal examination you can do what is known as a double setup in theater where you do your vaginal examination in theater such that if this woman actually and it starts bleeding, you can easily convert that to a C-section. Now remember that the contraindication for vaginal examination, number one, if the patient is exaggerated, number two, if there is a placenta previa major that has been diagnosed via ultrasound, number three, if there's malpresentation, if it's an elderly prime gravida, if there's a previous history of a C-section, then you definitely just want to deliver them via C-section. Then of course, low rupture of membranes, uh, you induce labor by, for, by low rupture of membranes using your long uh, caucus forceps. Then of course, in the less degree of placenta previa, your type one and your type two anterior. Now the fingers must be inserted with inside the vagina to prevent cord prolapse because there's a high risk of cord prolapse. You also should, uh, an oxytocin drip may, should be started unless if it's contraindicated. Then of course, if amniotomy fails, then you, I have to take this person for C-section. Now, precautions that you have to take when you're delivering this patient vaginally. Number one, you should have some blood that is ready. Number two, methagene or oxytocin should be given in the third stage of labor. You can give methagene at um, 0 0.2 milligrams uh, IV or you can give oxytocin 10 international units IM. Then, of course, you should examine the cervix as soon as the child is born to rule out any evidence of tears and then of course the baby's blood hemoglobin must also be checked and if transfusion they need a transfusion then the transfusion can be offered if the patient actually has heavy aph this is considered as an emergency so they're treated in theater so you can make the double setup that i told you about where you first examine this a patient with a vaginal examination then of course you palpate for any bogginess in the vaginal phonuses you can have a double setup if the gestational age is greater than 28 weeks if placenta previa if it's complete placenta previa then you should consider induction then if there is a minimal or moderate aph and the child is preterm you admit them to the antenatal ward cross match them IV axis, then of course do the obstetric scans, give them steroids, your dexamethasone, and then if they're stable, then consider delaying the delivery until 24 hours after the second dose of the steroids. If there's no uh, heavy bleeding, then you have to wait and do an elective uh, C-section at about 37 weeks of gestation. If there's no APH and the placenta previa was found routinely on ultrasound, then we admit them to the antenatal ward when they are greater than 28 weeks, and then we treat them as above. Then of course we should prepare for the management of PPH because there's a risk of PPH. So you want to perform a third, active third stage of management of labor. In addition to this, give them an infusion of oxytocin, 20 international units and one liter of normal saline. Then of course placenta, accreta and increta should be suspected if there is a previous uterine scar. Now here is a schematic to help you look at the management. So let's just pretty much go through it very quickly. So here, all, page, all APH patients should be admitted. 
of course, your general examination and your abdominal examination, clinical assessment, HB, hematocrit, ABO, and RH blood grouping, resuscitate them if they need be, do an ultrasound. Of course, it's not everyone that's going to be admitted. Some people will admit them for some time, then we discharge them if the bleeding has stopped and was sure that there's no hemorrhage that can happen afterwards. Then, of course, if there's no bleeding, if the pregnancy is less than 37 weeks, if the hemodynamically stable and the fetal heart sound, the old tracing is good and the cardiotocograph is, it shows a reactive fetus and it's okay, then we expect in management until 37 weeks. And of course, if they, they are bleeding continuously, if the pregnancy is more than 37 weeks, if the patient is in labor, if they accentuated, if there's no fetal heart rate or there are some fetal abnormalities on the other hand, then give them steroids and then deliver them. Uh, if they are less than 34 weeks, give them steroids and then deliver them. Then, of course, if the placenta is clearly 2 to 3 centimeters away from the cervical os, we can do our vaginal examination in the operation theater with a double setup. Perform artificial rupture of membranes with oxytocin. Then, of course, if there's a satisfactory progress of labor, we deliver them vaginally. If the bleeding continues or if there's, there's no labor, we convert it to a C-section delivery. If the placental edge is within two centimeters of the internal os or the placenta previa is greater than a type one, so type two, posterior especially, the type three and the type four, then there's no need of actually doing a, a vaginal examination, just deliver them via C-section. So I hope this really makes sense. Now, we can minimize the mortality and morbidity associated with placenta previa, especially in the antenatal clinic. So they should get antenatal care to prevent anemia because we want to raise the, the blood store such that even if this woman loses blood, we can assure that at least they can afford to lose certain amounts of blood. So an antenatal diagnosis of a low-lying placenta is made at 20 weeks with routine ultrasound. They need to repeat this at 34 weeks to confirm the diagnosis. And of course, significance of the warning uh, hemorrhage, that brisk bleeding should never be ignored. Then, of course, you should also do a color flow Doppler and placenta previa to detect any placenta accreta. And where this is not possible, such women with an increased risk of placenta accreta should be managed as if the, they have a placenta accreta until you prove otherwise. Now, what are some of the complications? They may be during pregnancy, you may have shock from the bleeding, uh, fetal malpresentation such as a breech presentation. You may have abnormal lies like a transverse lie, even some other unstable lies. You may have premature labor. Then during the labor itself, you may have early rupture of membranes, cord prolapse because of the abnormal attachment of the cord, the slow dilatation of the cervix because the placenta is in the lower segment, intrapartum hemorrhage because of further separation of the placenta from the lower segment as the cervix dilates. You may have postpartum hemorrhage. I'll give you the reasons why in the next slide. There may be some retained placenta. You may have increased risk of operative delivery. Then, of course, uh, in the puparium, you may have sepsis because of the increase in risk of operative interference. And, of course, the placenta site is quite close to the vagina. And then anemia and the devitalized state of the patient could be a reason why this patient could have sepsis. Then there could be sub-involution of the uterus as well as embolism. Now, these are the things that cause PPH. Number one, there is imperfect retraction of the lower uterine segment, which the placenta is implanted. Remember that in the upper segment, I say that the, the blood vessels are covered or surrounded by muscles crisscross in a crisscrossing manner, such that when the blood when the uterus actually contracts, they clamp on the blood vessels. This is not the same thing in the lower segment. Then, of course, the second thing is that you get a larger surface area of the placenta with an atonic uterus because of a pre-existing anemia. The third thing is because the placenta may be morbidly attached to the uterus in the case of placenta accreta, increta, and percreta. This is very common in the lower segment of the uterus. Now remember that in a woman that has had a previous C-section, the risk of placenta previa uh, increases the risk of placenta accreta. So the, the risk of placenta accreta actually increases significantly as the number of C-sections actually increases. So it increases from about 6 to 10% if they've had one C-section to actually more than 60% if they've had four C-sections. Then, of course, you may also have placenta accreta where you have the abnormal attachment of the placenta villi to the uterine wall. It's quite rare, about 1 in 700 pregnancies. But, of course, it complicates 5 to 15% of pregnancies with placenta previa. 25% of the pregnancies with placenta previa and one C-section and almost 60% with placenta previa and two previa C-sections. 
Now, the neonatal complications include preterm birth with the complications of prematurity, low birth weight in about 15% of the cases, asphyxia and intrauterine fetal demise, which is due to separation of the placenta, compression of the placenta, compression of the cord, with maternal hypovolemia and shock. Death may actually also happen due to cord accidents. Then birth injuries can be seen with the increase in operative interference. Then of course remember that placenta previa is not a cause of intrauterine growth restriction. Now death is often going to be occurring due to massive hemorrhage during antenatal, the, the antepartum, intrapartum and postpartum period. Then of course operative hazards, infections, embolism may also occur and cause death. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and learned a lot concerning placenta previa. If you did, please show some support. Hit the subscribe, subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend, we are doing lectures on the channel. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu, to Zambia and beyond. Until next time, bye bye.